Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, and got partway through. And uh, rather than rush the point, I uh, stopped. It's too important to be summarized or rushed for continuity. Let me begin by reading, beginning with verse 14. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. I'll read down through verse 17, and then we'll begin today in verse 18. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, and then we go on to may be able to comprehend the love of Christ. Two major points, two or three major points. This is a prayer. It's one of the most glorious prayers in the Bible. And perhaps I have to reveal some partiality. This is perhaps my favorite passage in the entire Bible. It's so beautifully teaches and explains the love of God. In the beginning of this prayer, Paul identifies purposes, reasons that he's praying that he would grant you, that he would not give you based on what you earned, a grant is a gift, that he would give you not according to what you have earned your merit, but according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Second request, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend. There is a distinction between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which occurs beginning with regeneration or the new birth and does not change until you go home to glory. Very different from Christ dwelling in us. And the word dwell here means to, to be permanently and comfortably living here. Not a stranger living in this place, but someone who comfortably and permanently lives here. And this is by faith. The Holy Spirit's coming in regeneration is by a sovereign act of God. Jesus tells that to Nicodemus in John 3. The wind bloweth where it listeth. You hear the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, nor where, whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. The Gospel Transformation Study Bible Notes identifies as part of this prayer and what Paul is really praying for, for the Ephesians, for us, and what we should pray for each other, for strength to overcome big sins. Do you hide out from your big sins and pray for strength to overcome the little ones in your life? No, pray for strength to overcome the big ones, to change bad habits, and to make us into better followers of Christ. I believe Paul in inspired scripture says the same thing even better in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. The word constrain is transferred, translated from a Greek word which means to exercise control. The love of Christ is the controlling motive and factor in our lives. Not fear of separation from God in the end, but the love of Christ for what he's done. We sang the hymn this morning. It's been on my mind for the last several days as I've pondered the love of God. Do you want proof of this, my love? The best place to go for proof of the love of Jesus is Calvary. Calvary survey than heaven above. Paul prays as we begin verse 18 that, and he's still praying for something that can only occur 
And he's praying not for lost sinners, but for church people. He describes them very dearly in the first chapter, and they are already born again. They're already children of God. But he's praying that not only does Christ dwell in them by faith, but that as Christ dwells in them by faith, they may be able to comprehend with all saints the breadth and length and depth and height to comprehend, to effectively understand. There, there's, a, there's a twist, and I love Bible twist. In, eight, in verse 18, Paul prays for, the, for us to comprehend, to effectively understand. And in verse 19, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. <laughs> so you can comprehend it, but don't ever think you can wrap your whole mind around the whole of it. It's, it's impossible to do. I stumbled across a beautiful story this week. In the last, was it the last century or the prior? During Napoleon's rule, his army discovered a prison, an ancient prison that had been used during the Spanish Inquisition to imprison Christians who didn't believe according to the prevailing ideas of the day. They literally opened a cell that apparently had not been opened since it was actively used. They found the skeleton of the Christian who had been imprisoned there. The iron shackle was still around his ankle. He had, with some piece of rock or something sharp, etched a symbol on the wall of his prison. It was roughly a Spanish cross and words at each point of the cross, height, depth, length, breadth, the very words all used to describe. I, the, the more I ponder, this dear saint held in a tiny cell for his faith, number one, needed that reminder daily to constrain and control his fear, his depression, his discouragement, all the emotions that you and I cannot imagine that he suffered during his unknown years in that tiny cell. But he also left it as a lively testimony to us. He comprehended something of the love of Christ. The scope of God's love and with God's love, salvation, Paul describes that the two go hand in hand in the book of Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, and then concludes the chapter that no, nothing in existence or all things in existence together cannot separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. The love of God in his saving grace exceeds our personal imagination or thoughts. I give you a couple of passages to make the point. In the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 9, John was blessed to look into heaven and to see at that point in time, in the first century, all of those who had been saved from the beginning to that day. 90% of them were not singing praise to Moses and the other praise to Jesus. They were all singing praise to Jesus. For thou wast slain, and by thy blood thou hast redeemed us to God out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Folks, Every doctrine 
that teaches salvation associated with some form of human instrumentality or means falls short of this description. The gospel has been spread widely, but it has not been spread so widely as to reach every family under heaven. And even if it were to be so spread today, there are families who have become extinct from ages past, from disease and war and other, other human tragedies. What about them? These people were from every family, every tongue, every language, every people, every culture, and every nation. And lest you try to go too broadly, out of prevents the idea of universal salvation, doesn't it? It's not all people, period, but the redeemed out of is a greater number than human estimates typically make that number to be. Certainly the modern salvation by works or by hybrid works and, and grace will often refer to the biblical passages that deal with discipleship, not salvation, and depict the number of actually saved people as a very small number in humanity. I heard about one of those people driving across Los Angeles in a car with a friend, and he said, I wonder if God has a half dozen saved people in Los Angeles County. Now that's my wife and my son, John, and his wife and us four and no more. That's not biblical teaching or salvation according to scripture. And yet the idea that is often taught that God loves every human being who was ever born, but he doesn't do anything for all of them. He just makes something possible for all of them also fails. It's extremely wide, but extremely shallow. Right in this same lesson, the very same verse, he is able. Yes, he is able. Verse 20. And in the book of Hebrews, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by their confession, by their faith, by their obedience. No, that come to God by him. And then he explains that point, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Their salvation by his ability is based on what he does as the mediator, not what they do. So the breadth of God's love and the depth of God's love are the same. I'll just examine one other dimension of the love of God. Jeremiah 31, three, the Lord hath appeared unto me of old saying, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. I recently discovered that the word everlasting is translated from a Hebrew word, which means literally to the vanishing point. I have loved thee with a love that goes all the way to the vanishing point past and the vanishing point future everlasting. The King James translators wisely, I think, chose the word that says it. So the depth of God's love, the width of God's love, and the length of God's love are sufficient. And then verse 19, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. How can you know something that passes knowledge? I mentioned in the first message, I believe, the fact that in 1492, Columbus discovered America, but he didn't discover California. 
He didn't discover Half Dome in Yosemite. He didn't discover the Grand Canyon. He didn't discover the Everglades of Florida. But he discovered America. He saw there was something there that had formerly not been a, believed to exist. That's the way we may be able to know, to experience, to some degree, the love of God. As I think about this sense of learning, of experiencing, intelligent comprehension is what that word really means. The love of God. I'm, I'm made to think. Perhaps what we see in today's culture, godly Christian people more investing themselves in hate than love. If you disagree with my politics, if you disagree with me about whatever, then I hate you. It may be that we're measuring our sense of God's love by human love. The thought occurs to me, I cannot love you like Jesus loved me sacrificially, selflessly, unless I believe he loves me that way. And the more I believe he loves me in that way, the easier it is for me to love you that way. That's why I believe Paul so earnestly bows down in urgency with this prayer and prays for us to know, to some extent, intelligently comprehend and perceive that God does love us that way. Therefore, I can love you that way too. That makes this a beautiful passage, wonderful passage. that he may be filled with all the fullness of God. The measure of his filling of us <clears throat> is not our merit, but his fullness. That is translated from a simple Greek word, ina, which means purpose. The purpose for the prayer and the purpose for us to begin to perceive, to comprehend. And he says, you are able to do it. So you, we can say, I can't, I don't know how. Yes, he says, you are. You are able as a child of God in faith to do it. We can't without that faith and that focus. His love produces this fullness when we perceive it by faith. What's the impact? <coughs> Pardon me. What's the impact of his love on us when we truly do perceive that he loves us this way? That he loved us precisely this way and that's why he went to Calvary. That's why I highlighted, I, I thought about having you sing during the message, but I'd have to lead it and I'd, I'd probably flub the tune. So I, I decided to bypass that. But the words of the hymn, do you want proof of this, my love? Calvary survey, then heaven above, see how the teeming millions do. And I want to change one word in the poem. My grace sufficient was for you. You're in heaven then and you know. It's all experience. In Matthew 24, verse 12, Jesus makes an accurate statement, but a statement that should trouble us. He is precisely predicting prophetically 
God's judgment against the city of Jerusalem. He announced the verdict and the reason based on the evidence stated in chapter 23 of Matthew, the charges against first century Jerusalem. The charges are multiple and grave and deserving judgment. In chapter 24, the disciples don't get it, like you and I sometimes don't get it. And as they, they're in the proximity to the city of Jerusalem, and the, the landmark in the city is this beautiful, beautiful temple. And they see one of the sides or shape or silhouette of the temple, and, and they say, Lord, look what a beautiful thing that is. And Jesus burst their bubble. Don't you understand what I've just said? The time is coming. And before he finishes what he says in chapter 24, he'll say, it will come to pass in your generation, in your lifetime, when there will not be one stone left standing on another. That temple will be destroyed. It's an awful judgment. It's righteous. It's deserved. But it's dreadful. And in chapter 24, verse 12, he says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Abounding iniquity is a constant with us in one sense. Is, is humanity any meaner today than it was two years ago? No. You, you read on a regular basis of cruel, inhumane things that one human does to another. But it seems in times of intense trial, war, severe illness, yes, wicked humans will inhumanely take advantage of each other. That's iniquity abounding in Jesus' sense of what he's teaching here. And he says, because this iniquity does abound, the love of many shall wax cold. He didn't say the love of all. Think about that prisoner in the Spanish prison who despite being in prison for his faith, not for some evil crime he committed against humanity, but for his faith, he's imprisoned and dies, the shackles still around his skeletal ankle. Did his love wax cold? <laughs> no. To remind him to look to his, the source of his love, he etched the cross with the dimensions of this text on the wall to look at it. Every time he looked up, he saw that instead of reminding himself of the iniquity that put him there. But there are believers, sincere believers, who become discouraged, dissuaded, and, and they start looking at the iniquity instead of looking at the deliverer from iniquity. And their love waxes cold. When we look at abounding iniquity, rest assured your iniquity will wax cold. The joy you formerly cherished will begin to fade. Close fellowship you once felt with the Lord will be a thing faintly remembered. If you notice that in your experience, look away from the bounding iniquity and look to a love, as the poem has said, oh love that will not let me go. A love that is as high as it is deep and as wide as it is long. 
and start trying to comprehend that love. And you'll stop thinking about iniquity and your love. How can it not revive when you recall and really become convinced that is talking about his love to me? That'll melt an iceberg. <laughs> Verse 20. Based on looking and perceiving intelligently what we can of the love of God now unto him that is able. You don't have to go any further, do you? That says it, but let's go. Let's not stop mid-sentence. Able to do. He could have used one of the words, but he used three words plus a clause. Able to do exceeding abundantly above. Okay, what do you ask the Lord to do? What do you think? He is able to do in your life with your problems and your trials and your troubles and your needs. How much is he able to do? I grant he's able, whatever that is in your mind. But let me tell you something, folks. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above anything you thought you needed or sought. He's able to do it. Look to him by faith, trust and obey according to the power that worketh in us. No, it's not our power. It's his power at work in us. And then the crowning glory, the icing on the cake unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ. I have said, I honestly believe that we're living in a season of time when professing Christians understand and therefore believe less than at any time in the history of Christianity about New Testament teaching about the New Testament church. I believe that. Well, if I go to church anywhere, I'm at church on Sunday. Why don't you ask the Galatians and what Paul taught them if that's the case? What's the purpose of a New Testament church? I've gone to some of the modern churches. You know, they have a praise band. I've learned when you walk into the lobby and they have a big bowl full of ear stoppers you better grab them because your ears are going to hurt if you don't paul tells us the primary function and purpose of his new testament church it's not to entertain christians it's not as cryptically as it was true J. Vernon McGee's description of the time in which he lived, how much more it is so today. Uh, we live in an age of preacherettes delivering sermonettes to Christianettes. <laughs> What's the purpose? Why did you drive a long distance on the freeway to be here today? This text answers the right way and tells us why we should be here unto him be glory our job here is to glorify god we will have joy over there when we have it now when we glorify him but the purpose of church is to glorify god in everything we say and do. Let all things, Paul says, be done 
unto edification. I was approached a few months back by dear friends I've known for many years, and they invited me to participate in a biweekly roundtable discussion. They had started with COVID Old Baptist Weekly. They're from Texas, mostly from Texas. And they wanted to have something a little less formal and they wanted me to be a participant. We've been now three bi-weekly sessions on the armor of God in Ephesians chapter six. During one of those sessions, one of the men made a powerful point. What happens in a church when something doesn't turn out quite right? Well, you know, I could have done it better. Well, somebody wasn't watching what they were doing or it wouldn't have gone so sideways. We've got two people who took on a whole lot more than, than they imagined or we did with our construction project and a contractor who did some things very well, but who's been really slow. Shall I be that kind? Well, you know, if they had been on their P's and Q's more, it wouldn't have happened that way. Someone says, the, the, the greatest problem with American Christians is they devour their wounded. Paul in Ephesians 6 compares the church to an army. Ephesians 6 is not about you personally and individually wearing your, arm, your armor and being a Rambo soldier. It's about a church collectively putting on its armor, each individual person, and filling his role as a member of the battalion of Jesus Christ at Bellflower or wherever your church is located. What happens when an army senses a serious assault from the enemy? Do they start picking fault with the manufacturer of the ammunition? No, they do that. And that's what we ought to be doing when things don't go right in church. Get together with each other. Don't get at each other's neck. Get together with each other. Get on your knees and pray. Give glory to God in the church i can't give glory to him when i'm at your throat when i'm nitpicking your faults and you're nitpicking mine and we've all got them <laughs> and usually the person who speaks the loudest about faults has the most <laughs> does that give glory to god no sir unto him be glory in the church Paul prayed. He not only prayed, he got on his knees and prayed urgently that the Lord have glory in his church. And that glory is not by a, a, hoot, hoot, a hoot nanny preacher or a hallelujah deacon. It's by Jesus Christ. That's the reason for glory in the church. It's all about him. It's not all about us. And Paul says, this is going to happen if we fail, if this church ceases to exist in Belfar, California, it won't be God's fault. It'll be ours. We can't blame God for that. It'll be ours, and it won't be a mystery. There'll be somebody that'll know why. It'll be our own unfaithfulness. But he has promised Somewhere until the second coming, there's going to be a church that is dedicated beginning to end to giving him glory by Jesus Christ. The church at Ephesus, when you read the Ephesian letter, it seems like this is the perfect church. When you want to go to church at Ephesus the way they were, the way Paul wrote to them, man, that would be a wonderful place to go. Read the letter, the mini letter to the elder, the minister, the angel of the church in, in Revelation chapter three. They've got a little problem, more than a little problem. And of all the ironies, what was the problem? The Lord judged and warned the Ephesian church about 
in Revelation 3, you have left your first, and that word first doesn't mean first in order of time, it means first in order of importance. What's really important in our lives? When all the fluff is pushed away and reality comes in, you have left your first love. Paul was praying earnestly, and perhaps for a time, they did by faith perceive and comprehend that love and live in it. But within 60 to 70 or 80 years of the time Paul wrote this letter, probably more like 30 or 40, they had slipped and left. We can't go to the Ephesian church today. It's not there. But there's a church here. There's a church. Santa Paula, Lindsay, other places around, all over the country. There are churches that believe and preach what we believe and preach in Africa, in the Philippines. We've had personal experience with a few folks from both of those continents. Remember Brother Martin Onyani from Africa? He came over here and he preached the same Jesus we preach here. Brother Danny, other Philippine pastors who've come and preached to us. Our faithful hymn selector every single Sunday. She's from the Philippines. There may not be a church in Ephesus, but the Lord's going to have a church somewhere until the second coming, until the trumpet blows. And for that church, those churches which are focused and dedicated to giving him the glory by Jesus Christ when he comes, It'll just be a folding from this church into a much more glorious gathering in eternity in heaven. Throughout all ages, and then he goes beyond time, world without end. And in the middle of a sermon, the Apostle Paul said, Amen. God bless you.